All right, we can go ahead and get started. It's noon, everybody. So hello and welcome to the first of three webinars in this series about organic rotational no-till production for grain crops. Um, this is hosted by Rodale Institute. And my name is Christy Borelli. I work with Penn State Extension in Northeast SARE, and I'll be moderating today's session as we discuss no-till organic cover cropping and weed suppression for soil health. There's two other sessions that are gonna occur at the same time and place in this series um, for the next two Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time. On February 10th, we're gonna focus on innovative weed control tools and no-till systems. And on February 17th, we'll focus on planting green te techniques for potential use in organic systems. So all three webinars are gonna feature a few presentations followed by an open question and answer session with the speakers and a few additional experts in each of the topic areas. So in addition to the Rodale Institute, this webinar series was supported by um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, Northeast SARE, and Penn State Extension. So if you're interested in attending the other webinars, you can form, find more information and register at the Rodale Institute webpage. If you go to their link for education, you'll find all the webinars listed right there. And there's no cost for attendance. Um, all the webinars are gonna be recorded and available for future viewing. So this one is rec being recorded right now. So it's with my pleasure today, um, I wanna welcome our speakers and just give a quick overview of the session. So we're gonna start off, uh, Dr. Drew Smith is the Chief Operating Officer and Scientist at the Rodale Institute. And he's gonna provide an overview on organic no-till farming. And after John, uh, Drew speaks, Dr. John Wallace, who is an Assistant Professor of Weed Science at the De Department of Plant Science at Penn State University, is gonna discuss a few best practices for managing weeds with cover crops in organic systems. After him, Dr. Mary Barbercheck is gonna share a few um, ongoing research projects that feature some of the work that Penn State is doing in the area of organic agriculture. And then Sam Malriott, who is from the Rodale Institute, is going to show a few short videos on cover crop management using the roller crimper, and those will complement um, John and Drew's talks and our overall discussion today. And then we're going to go into a panel discussion. Um, Drew and John will be joined with Andy Flinchbaugh and Dean James, who are two farmers who have various experiences using cover crops in their farming systems. And we're going to ask that you hold all questions until the panel uh, session begins, but you can go ahead and put them in the chat at any time. That just helps us. It's wonderful. We have almost, uh, we have 177 people on right now, which is fantastic. But just to help us manage seeing those questions come in, go ahead and just type them in there. And if you want to say them out loud, we can unmute you and let you do that. But we'd ask that you'd still put them in there. Um, so before we get started, just a really brief overview of Zoom for those of you ha who haven't used it. If you shake your mouse over the screen um, in the bottom left, uh, corner, you're going to see a microphone and a video camera, and you can mute yourself or show and stop your video. We would ask that all your mics are muted unless you're talking um, to reduce background noise, and the use of the video is optional. If you're having internet connections, though, sometimes turning your video off can be really helpful. Um, finally, you can see the control, uh, the view at the top. Um, top right, you'll see view. You can go into gallery view or um, speaker view. Right now we're sharing a screen so everybody should be on the side. Um, as I mentioned, the format is open Q&A. So again, drop your questions in the, in the chat box and we'll follow along that way. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce, introduce Drew Smith and allow him to talk. Welcome, Drew. Hi, Christy. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Thanks. Great, thanks. Well, I'm glad to be here with everybody and excited to talk about one of our favorite topics, organic no-till. Um, so as the name implies, we're talking about organic no-till. So, so everything that I'm going to be talking about today assumes that we don't have herbicides as a tool in our, in our toolbox to accomplish no-till. And uh, that also means that we're not practicing continuous or zero no-till. So sometimes people ask, well, that seems a little bit misleading to say organic no-till if there's sometimes there's tillage in the system. Um, and I'll explain, but you know what I call the system is organic rotational cover crop based one pass system no-till, uh, which is a which is a mouthful. So it's just easier to say organic no-till. And I'll go through those steps and that'll be more clear. Um, 
one second, it's not advancing. There we go. Um, so, you know, why do we why do we care about this? Why do we why are we in, interested in in no till at, at Rodale Institute? We're trying to design systems that are effective, efficient, and regenerative. And as you see in this picture here, uh, if you're a farmer, you've probably been maybe not in this situation, but in a situation where you've had a malfunction and it's it's held up timing and and timely uh, you know, field management. But we know that tillage, while it's effective for crop production, uh, it's labor intensive, it's energy intensive, um, and it's time intensive, and you know it's equipment intensive. So it's it's effective, but maybe not the most efficient method. So we're looking for systems that are more efficient. Uh, and we know that when we till, we also open those system up to damage. Uh, it, it's estimated that it takes about 20 years to form one millimeter of topsoil. Um, but as we've all seen that in, in one rain and just maybe a matter of minutes, uh, we can lose inches of topsoil. And that's a, that topsoil is a valuable resource. So while tillage might be effective, uh, it's also not regenerative. And uh, through our research and research at a lot of other places, we've actually been able to, uh, to practice organic systems and get yields that are comparable to, the, to a conventional system. That usually includes uh, till, tilling in a, a cover crop or green manure, uh, probably organic uh, inputs like compost. Uh, it means more tillage through seedbed preparation, uh, maybe a stale seedbed where we flush the weeds and do multiple, uh, multiple tillage events before planting, and then often repeated cultivation throughout the season. So we recognize that in our organic systems, while we've they've become we've become effective in organic, um, we're not really achieving that standard of regenerative that we'd like. And so we're that's where our interest in no-till lies. And then as we consider cover crops, um, you see up here I say no-till with no cover crops is no good. Um, and I don't just say that lightly. That's after uh, looking at years of research and research, not just only at the Rodale Institute, but across the country. So let me say it again, no till with no cover crops is no good. Um, here's an example of a, a cornfield that had high residue on the field in the spring. It had contour strips and grass waterway, just about every conservation practice that could be put around that field was in place. Uh, but during heavy rains in the spring, we still have significant levels of erosion that cover crops could mitigate. Uh, I'm gonna just show you just one example of some data from our farming systems trial. So at the Rodeo Institute, we have a farming systems trial that began in 1981 and still continues to today. But we can get an understanding of no-till systems uh, because in 2008, we implemented no-till in all of the systems that were already in place. So the three systems that we started with was a conventional system or are a conventional system. And this follows the standard practices. We get our recommendations from uh, Penn State University on what, what are the right inputs, like fertilizer and chemicals. Um, and this is typically a corn soybean rotation. The legume system is an organic system that is relying solely on cover crops as forms of fertility. So leguminous cover crops like vetch and clover as well as rye. And then the manure system closely resembles a livestock operation where we have inputs like composted uh, manure and it has a more diverse crop rotation that includes a perennial phase of alfalfa and orchard grass. And like I said, in 2008, all of these included a, a no-till phase. In 2015, we actually added what we we're calling a conventional or a conservation conventional system, um, because the conventional system includes no cover crops. So the conventional, while the conventional no-till has been continuous no-till since 2008, it's had no cover crops. And the con conservation conventional includes rye as a cover crop and wheat in the rotation. But you can see that in all these systems, except for the manure system, we did not see a benefit uh, of increased soil organic carbon in the no-till systems. And I could, I could show a whole bunch of soil health indicators 
and they generally follow this trend where we don't see really improvements of soil health just because we practice no-till. It takes cover cropping, it takes crop rotation, uh, organic inputs, perennial phase in the, in the cropping system to really regenerate soil. And what our scientific understanding from looking at studies around the country is that no-till by itself with, without cover crops and other practices slows the degradation of soil, but it doesn't regenerate, restore, or build soil health. So cover crops is an important component. And it's especially important in an organic no-till system. Uh, you've probably seen gardens where we, we bring in mulch like a straw and we use that as, as a mulch to suppress weed. Now that's, that can be very effective, um, but it's not very efficient on a larger scale system. So what if we grew those mulch, that mulch, that weed suppressing mulch in the field where we wanted to grow the crop? And that's, and that's exactly what we're doing uh, in this system. So here's an example of cereal rye that was planted in mid-September here at Rodale Institute, which is located in Kutztown, PA, which is uh, kind of central eastern Pennsylvania. And you can see this is uh, probably November and we still haven't taken corn off, off the fields in the, in the background there, but you have a very strong cover that's going to be protecting that soil uh, from erosion and wind and some other, other processes as well as scavenging for any nutrients like nitrogen that are in that soil and not allowing them to be leached. And in the beginning, as farmers started thinking about this, a lot of the, a lot of those farmers uh, that pioneered this system were here in Pennsylvania. Uh, they started using systems like, uh, like a colder packer and a stalk chopper. And these worked really well when we had herbicides. But in many cases, the, the cover crop that was rolled down uh, stood back up and, and could almost have been a weed in some cases because it wasn't effectively killed. Uh, we, 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 we did studies with flail mowers and the flail mower actually was very effective as you would imagine at killing the cover crop. And because it left the residue straight down uh, and didn't throw it out, it actually provided a good, a good residue or a good weed suppressing mulch. However, because it was chopped up in so many pieces, we, found, we tended to find and still do in our research that that mulch breaks down later in the season and can allow weeds to, to emerge. So we were looking for a tool and our, uh, at the time, our farm director, now CEO, Jeff Moyer, designed what we were calling the roller crimper that you see here in the picture. This is the original uh, roller crimper that was built in the shop of John Brubaker, who's a dairy farmer, neighbor, and friend of us here at the Rodale Institute. And this uses the, the teeth here that you can see to crimp very much like you might crimp a, uh, with a hay bind uh, to crimp the cover crop. And it also, the drum we fill with water. So the weight of it also helps to effectively kill the cover crop. And we, we, we front mount it and it can go on the back. It, it has a three, this one particularly uh, is three point hitch mounted. So we could go on the back, but if we can mount it to the front and then put a no-till planter on the back, now we have our one pass system. So we have an organic cover crop based one pass no-till system. Um, in addition to that being very effective, um, it's also very efficient. And we now have a cover crop that is on top of the soil, protecting the soil. Our studies show that we retain more moisture in the soil. So when we have years of drought, we can get better crop production with this system. So we're actually moving in the, in the, towards being also more regenerative. So let me just review the system. We, we plant a winter annual cover crop in the fall. Um, you probably, you know, there's variations of the system, um, but planting an annual crop is important, which I'll explain in a second. And then we terminate that cover crop in the late spring when it's time to plant. Some very important considerations to think about here are uh, timing of termination, which I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit of timing of planting cover crops in a minute. But 
it's very important to terminate the cover crop when it has switched from a reproductive phase to, I'm sorry, when it switched from a vegetative phase to a reproductive phase. And so what I mean by that is if we look at this picture and we had cereal rye, if you plant it, if you, or if you rolled it and crimped it before it formed its head and started to shed pollen, it would, you would roll it and it would just stand right back up. Um, but if you wait until it's starting to shed pollen and it's going into a reproductive phase, uh, then you can get effective kill. And the other crop we tend to use mostly is, is hairy vetch. And similar to that, we wait till we get to about 75 to 100% of the plant is in flowering. So we roll down, we crimp the cover crop, we plant all in one pass, and then we provide a weed suppressing mulch that can hopefully suppress weeds throughout the, throughout the season. So I'm just gonna give you one case study here, uh, 2013 growing corn in the hairy vetch. Um, we, we, you can see on the front of the tractor, we were rolling and crimping, and then we were planting using our monosome no-till uh, planter on the top left. We've added additional weight on that planter. And we, we prefer not to use, you can use uh, row cleaners on the front um, and then no-till colders to, to achieve this. But in the organic system, we prefer to, to take the row cleaners off so that we prevent really any spots where weeds might emerge within the row. So a couple, couple of weeks later, we should have a thick mat of the hairy vetch terminating, uh, starting to break down and providing nitrogen to the corn crop. Uh, a month or so later, uh, we hope it looks like this. The crop is starting, the corn crop starting to canopy, and we'll also be able to suppress other weeds that might start to come up uh, through that, that mulch as it breaks down. And when we look at that at, at the system, we do a comparison of our standard practice that we, that we perform here at Rodale Institute, you know, the standard has about nine passes through the, through the field. Um, and, our, and we had 143 bushel per acre corn, which is pretty good uh, for our area. Um, but the no-till, we went through the field twice. We rolled and planted, and then we came back and harvested. Uh, we had 160 bushels per acre. So a significant reduction in time and cost in that system. And then if we take a look, I'm just showing this for revenue purposes in 2016. So in 2016, we had uh, 200 bushel per acre corn in our organic no-till system. Um, this was a record for us in our, in our area in, in the farming systems trial. But if you look at the conventional till system, which uh, the majority of our county is practicing and really the majority of the country is practicing for grain crop production. Uh, we got 140 bushels per acre, which was exactly the, the county average. But when you consider the price premiums for organic, uh, for the organic corn in this case, uh, this is a significant increase in revenue. So with those reduced costs and increase in revenue, uh, it can mean significant profits to the farm. So let me talk a little bit about cover crop establishment because this is very critical. Um, in our systems here, we've been generally using uh, cereal rye to be planted in the fall before soybean and hairy vetch to be planted in the fall before corn. Uh, and certainly recognizing that there's a lot more, more knowledge out there about cover crops um, that I'm not gonna present here, but that's, that's basically what we've been doing. And that's because the studies show that cereal rye produces the largest amount of biomass. So it gives us the best weed suppressing mulch and hairy vetch produces the greatest amount of nitrogen uh, to provide as fertility for the corn. Because remember we're an organic system. So we're limited to be able to uh, inject types of nitrogen that might be able to overcome a high carbon cover crop like, like the cereal rye. Um, it's important that we plant the cereal rye in our region between September 15th and September 30th and the hairy vetch from about August 15th to August 30th. And the reason is so that we get enough 
biomass in, in late spring when we go to plant our, our cash crop. You'll also notice here that I mentioned that we're still tilling to establish our cover crops. And that's because it's, it's critical to have good weed control uh, when we're establishing our cover crop crops to prevent weeds later in the spring. And then I mentioned earlier, rotational. So rotation is very important. We, if you grew, if you just grow corn, this is gonna be a very difficult system without herbicides. We need windows of opportunity to get the cover crops established. So this is just an example of our typical crop rotation at Rodeo Institute. Um, other farmers or other farms might grow different crops, but generally, if I just go through it quickly, our corn, uh, we don't have enough time to get rye established to get a wheat suppressing mold. So we plant rye, then we grow oats the next year. We take that off in July. That allows us enough time to get the rye established in September before soybeans. Uh, we try to get the soybeans off by, by October 1st, and that leaves us time to plant wheat. And then wheat allows us the opportunity to be taken off again in July sometime and a window of opportunity to plant hairy vetch before corn the next year. Um, so you see that we're still tilling, but we have these large windows of opportunity when we generally don't have too much rain and farmers can get into the fields when conditions are right to establish these cover crops. And Joe, just a couple more slides so it doesn't have to be all corn and soybeans. Uh, here's an, a, a picture of pumpkins being planted into Austrian winter pea and triticale. Uh, here's a farm in California growing eggplant. And uh, ultimately you have your organic rotational cover crop based one pass no-till mm -hmm. system. And I know we, don't, we won't be able to get to it, but you know, people ask, are weeds still an issue? Now I can't, I have this heavy high residue and I can't get in there with, with, uh, you know, with cultivating tools. And so that's a, that's a major area of research for us right now and a lot of others. We currently have a project with Wisconsin and Ohio State. So um, there's a lot of people working on this as you might be aware. And I think we're getting the, you know, every year we have improved, improvement within this system. But I thank you so much for your time today and look forward to talking to you later. Great, thanks Drew. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if everyone can please put your questions in the chat, I see lots of people doing those, so that, so thank you. Um, and we're gonna switch over to John Wallace. And we'll, again, if you didn't join right away, we'll be doing a panel at the end where we answer all the questions together. Welcome, John. All right, thanks, Christy. Um, yeah, so so good morning or afternoon. Um, yeah, so we're we're really lucky here in the Mid Atlantic to have a really large body of of research on the weed ecology and, and management practices in these high residue cover crop systems, including uh, what Drew described, the organic rotational no-till system. Um, and so what I'm going to do here for my presentation is just um, share a few lessons from that research. And the goal is not to tell you what type of weed management tactics you should be using, but uh, to describe what you might expect um, in, a, in your weed control responses or shifts in your weed community if you start to adopt some of these uh, rotational no-till practices into your system. Um, oops. So... Everything I'm going to talk about is 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 basically the same scenario that that Drew uh, laid out as far as a crop sequence. Um, so I'm going to be talking about rotational no-till organic soybeans. So you know the sequence there is a tillage event prior to seeding, uh, cereal rye, rolling that cereal rye down um, with a roller crimper um, to get mechanical termination, and then planting no-till planting uh, soybeans into that residue. And I'm also going to talk about uh, rotational no-till organic. And so similarly, we're uh, using tillage to establish that seed bed, incorporate residues, um, and good, good establishment of the cover crop. And then we're roll crimping in, in our corn systems. It would be either a monoculture of hairy vetch or a grass um, mixture with hairy vetch. There's 
other legumes that have been tried with mixed success, uh, as Drew suggested, um, Harry Vetch is a prolific biomass producer, can fix a lot of nitrogen and is crimpable. All right, so I'm just gonna jump in to some of the lessons from, from previous research. Um, and so one of the things that's always emphasized when you use this type of practice is to use uh, management practices that are gonna optimize cover crop biomass production in order to produce a large surface mulch for weed suppression. And the reason why that is, is research has shown that as you're increasing biomass, you're doing a number of things that suppress germination cues. So you're reducing light quantity and quality into the soil surface when you have a high level of surface mulch on the, sur um, on the surface. Um, you're also changing those soil um, conditions. So soil moisture and soil temperature, pulses of soil nitrates, all those uh, soil factors also contribute or trigger weed seed germination in the soil. And so we're altering those germination cues and suppressing or preventing um, a pretty high proportion of weeds from germinating in the soil. Um, but it, it, a lot, lots of weeds are still gonna come through um, mulch. We're not gonna entirely be able to suppress germination uh, and keep those seeds in the soil. And so for those species that do emerge into the mulch, uh, they now have to grow through that mulch uh, in order to establish and start to pho photosynthesize. And so what research has, has demonstrated is that, um, you know, those species that are germinating are relying on reserves in the seed, energy reserves in the seed to establish. And you can see uh, the larger the biomass um, that it, surface mulch that it has to grow through to establish uh, can produce some effects. So here we have velvet leaf that is a large enough seed and has enough reserves to grow through that surface mulch, but it comes at a cost. So when it's coming through a lot of mulch, it's spending all its energy reserves on um, the shoot and it doesn't have as much root production. And so it's gonna be a less competitive weed early in the season. Um, and in some cases, smaller seeded species are just not going to have enough uh, energy reserves in those seeds to make it through the mulch and will be killed or die prior to establishing. So that's why we see um, kind of a shift in um, weed species when we move into these systems. So this type of approach where we're relying on the cover crop mulch as the primary weed suppression mechanism tends to be more effective for smaller seeded annual species um, and, and in particular broadleaf species. And so this is an effective strategy for annual weeds, uh, less effective for perennial weeds that have those vegetative underground reproductive structures with a lot of energy reserves and can grow through that mulch. Um, and we also see some differences uh, in, in how well we suppress weeds based on their emergence patterns, whether they emerge early in the spring or later in the cash crop growing season. Okay, so the other thing beyond biomass that's important is the persistence of the mulch, all right? And so there's a number of factors that contribute to how long that mulch persists through the growing season. And so what we want is a persistent mulch, high levels of biomass and, and persistence throughout the growing season so that we can suppress weeds all the way into canopy closure of the crop. And so the factors that contribute to that are total biomass production, um, the weather, the region, so warmer temperatures, more precipitation, you're gonna see that those mulches degrade quicker. But um, another critical factor is the C to N ratio of the mulch. And so this is, becomes important when we're thinking about the corn sequence where we're growing legumes. So uh, hairy vetch has a low uh, C to N ratio in comparison to cereal rye when it's terminated uh, at the correct stage. And so we would suspect that uh, the legume or hairy vetch will not persist as long uh, in comparison to cereal rye because uh, it, it'll degrade uh, quicker. And then Drew mentioned too, um, one of the benefits of roll crimping is you leave that surface mulch intact. And so that creates less surface area for microbes to start breaking down the residue. Whereas if we're flail chopping or mowing the residue and chopping it up, a uh, much greater surface area uh, for those microbes to start working on that residue and we would see um, uh, much less persistence of the mulch. 
so that's why um, a, a lot of research has, has focused on um, looking at mixtures for a corn phase, a grass legume mixture. Um, and so what that does is when you include a grass in the mixture with the legume, it increases that C to N ratio, which helps to increase persistence. And it also lowers um, nitrogen availability early in the season, which um, may be taken up by weeds. And so that's what this figure on the right demonstrates that as long as we have some grass in the mix with hairy vetch, um, we get pretty good levels of weed suppression. But in the monoculture of hairy vetch, we're going to have a lot more nitrogen available to those weeds, and that mulch is going to persist, um, not persist as long. And so we see an increase in, in weed pressure uh, when we're using a monoculture. So there's some benefits to the mixture. Uh, the trade off, the drawback is uh, to get an effective termination, you have to have kind of matching phenology of those two species, the grass and the legume, in order to roll crimp at the right time and get um, an effective termination. Okay, so there's um, there's also some cultural practices that should be considered. So seeding date, as far as optimizing biomass, uh, probably the two biggest factors are seeding date and fertility. All right, so the earlier the seeding, the better. You're going to get that crop established. It's going to tiller the cereal rye, and you're going to end up with more biomass. So some research suggests that delaying um, seeding cereal rye from the beginning of September to the middle of October. Um, that later planting date, you're only going to reach about 75% of the maximum biomass potential uh, that you could be getting out of that cover crop. So the preceding crop is, is really critical. So as Drew showed, you know, small grains have a nice fit as the preceding crop for uh, some of these no-till sequences. And then residual end considerations. So what's your prior crop? How big is that uh, residual end pool? Um, if it's high, if you have a lot of you know, good organic matter and um, have a lot of green manures in your system, you may be able to maximize the biomass potential um, um, for zero rye. Okay, so uh, cover crop termination is, is extremely critical because if we don't terminate at the right time, we create volunteer weed issues related to the cover crop persisting as a weed in the system. And so uh, what the research suggests is the optimal timing for roll crimping cereal rye is at that anthesis stage. And so the picture you see there in the top right uh, with that seed head with uh, anthers all up and down the seed head. And if you were to roll it down, you would see a big plume of pollen. Um, vetch, again, 70% um, flowering is about the right stage to maximize um, a termination of hairy vetch. Um, and so our research has also shown, and, and we've seen this in our cropping systems experiments here, is that we can rarely achieve total control. And so we almost always have some of those cover crops going to seed. Um, and so that can create some issues in other phases of the rotation when it comes to managing those volunteer cover crops. Um, so another, another cultural practice is um, studies have suggested that there's a benefit to investing some more inputs when it comes to um, your seeding rates. So a higher cereal rye seeding rate, somewhere between two to three bushels, um, tends to, um, might not produce more biomass, but what, what we can achieve with those higher seeding rates is quicker ground cover, which is going to help um, suppress weeds in the cover crop. And then also may have an additional benefit when we roll down that cover crop for some early suppression of uh, summer annual weeds in the rolled system. Okay, so the other thing that we found is that there's a benefit to having additional tactics that you can employ in these high residue systems. And so the one that we have the most experience with is integrating high residue cultivation, both in a corn or soybean phase. And you can see a John Deere high residue cultivator there, which is just one a uh, broad single sweep in between a 30 inch row. So those sweeps are 20 inches wide. And so there's been a fair amount of research and uh, which has suggested that we can see decreases in total weed pressure, or weed biomass up to about 40 or 50% when we employ this tactic. And that's gonna be really important for decreasing the weed seed bank as we move forward into that rotation. 
So uh, efficacy with a culti uh, high residue cultivation is much like other cultivation tool. It's gonna to be really dependent on soil conditions. Um, so you can, the, the way that we control weeds with the high residue cultivator is by slicing shoots from the roots. And if you're working at the wrong depth, if you're too low or deep, as the picture on the left shows, uh, you're not gonna be able to control those weeds. But what we aren't doing is we're not inverting that soil. So we're leaving the, the, the surface mulch on the surface and our research has shown that there's pretty minimal effect on several soil health factors when we integrate high residue cultivation. So uh, another consideration is row spacing uh, as a way to um, increase weed suppression. And so we've looked at wide row soybean production where we're also integrating high residue cultivation and compared that to more narrow row um, um, uh, soybean spacing, so on 15 inch rows. And what that research has shown is that there's a trade-off that we can decrease total weed pressure by uh, having that high residue cultivation as an additional tactic in the wide row soybeans, but we don't always see a yield benefit. And so there's probably a number of factors that contribute to that. One of them is by uh, running that cultivator and kind of parting away the residue, we are potentially losing some of that soil moisture conservation benefit that we have from the mulch um, that we might be preserving in the 15 inch soybeans. Okay, another important thing, and, and Drew touched on this a little bit, um, is, is both your roll crimp design or the crimper that you're using and the planter setup can really impact weed pressure. Um, and so we uh, actually transitioned away from an INJ style roll crimper and used um, this newer design, um, in, an integrated roller on the planter, the ZRX system. Um, so we uh, use that for three years in a cropping system study. And um, you can see how that looks in the bottom right hand corner. We are using row cleaners. We were using row cleaners and trying to really minimize the amount of disturbance we were doing with the row cleaners, but also kind of ensuring that we were getting good stand establishment. And so that particular design is folding the residue um, kind of in between the rows uh, and it leaves those um, in row, that in row area more vulnerable uh, to weed recruitment. So it opens it up enough where we see higher levels of weed pressure um, when we use that type of system. So again, just the minimizing the amount of disturbance that you're doing in the row is really important for optimizing weed suppression potential. There's a potential trade-off um, related to stand establishment, but the equipment is just getting better and better uh, to facilitate um, good stand establishment in these types of systems. Okay, so last couple notes. What, what to expect if you start to adopt these high residue um, uh, phases in, in the corn and soybean phase of your rotation. Um, and so we've uh, had a couple of cropping systems experiments here at Penn State where we've looked at that, where we were doing this in corn and in soybeans, and we looked at the shift in the weed community. So a couple of things to expect. There's annuals that are more adapted to the no-till soybean system. So we often see common ragweed become more dominant in that system because it emerges early prior to rolling down cereal rye. And so it uh, can get up and then we don't kill it during that roll crimp uh, termination pass. So it's able to come through the residue. Foxtails are a problem. Grasses in general, I think are more suited um, for this or more adapted to this types, type of system in comparison to broadleaves. And then in no-till corn, as I suggested, this idea of uh, increasing nitrogen levels in that corn phase, we're going to see response to weed species um, that really respond to nitrogen. And so pigweed species are a good example. We often see a shift in pigweed pressure during the no-till corn phase. John, we're at time right now. Okay, oh, I'll, you can I'll finish up here. So the last, the last two things would be, um, you know, we would certainly also expect to see increased uh, pressure from perennial weeds in the system, as well as volunteer cover crops. And so um, if we're really trying to reduce the amount of soil disturbance in the system by using these types of practices, uh, we're gonna have to try to diversify disturbance in other ways. And so um, using winter annual cash crops, summer annual cash crops, perennials is a good way to kind of um, break pest cycles when it comes to weeds. Um, anytime you can 
um, have some harvest schedules that we can actually use that as a weed control event. Um, increasing crop competition, whether it's interseeding or frost seeding covers, relay cover cropping, all those combined with additional weed control tactics are going to be really important to sustainably uh, manage weeds in this type of system. So sorry, Christy, I went over a little bit. Um, but I will end there and just acknowledge all the work that's been done by um, you know, a number of different institutions and, and uh, on this subject. So thanks. No problem. Thanks, John. And so everyone, please keep your questions coming in the chat. And now we're gonna switch over to Mary Barbercheck. Some of John's work that he talked about is from Penn State, but Mary is, she's kind of got her finger on the pulse of a lot that we're doing at Penn State. So she's gonna present an overview of the agriculture that, or the organic agriculture we're doing. Okay, do you have my slides or should I share my screen? Um, I can do it for you. coming up yet it's not yet mm -mm. yep so just let me know when you want me to move forward advance okay um so do you, okay you do <clears throat> okay so i am going to very briefly and very rapidly um go over some of the organic activities at associated with penn state university and for our international visitors penn state is a land grant university and that means it's associated with the college of agriculture and the agricultural research station and we have three functions research extension and education and so i'll focus on our organic research uh, today okay next so um john uh described a lot about um one of the main research projects that we have and focus that we have, and that's on reducing tillage in organic systems. And um, we've been focusing on reducing tillage since about 2003. And we currently have a systems experiment set up on a 15 acre site um, that we call the Reduced Tillage Organic Systems Experiment or ROSE. And a lot of the research that John just covered came out of that and is coming out of uh, that. Our current focus in that research project is on intensification of grain production, tillage reduction, and uh, soil health. Okay. Next. Uh, adjacent <clears throat> to that experiment is a 35 acre experiment that's really focused on cover crops and cover crop diversity and this one is in a full tillage organic system um, and the focus of that the long-term focus of that uh, experiment is to look at the benefits and trade-offs associated with cover crop mixtures on a wide variety of responses on soil health environmental quality on um, Currently, there's a new focus on the uh, endemic micro microbiome and ability to establish microbial products in those uh, systems and on soil nitrogen dynamics. Okay. And then we have a whole array, and I know I haven't um, covered all of them. These are the ones that I'm aware of. In that ROSE site, the reduced tillage site, we have some embedded research projects. We're able to take advantage of that, the long-term nature of those projects to do uh, really focused research within those. Um, one is on beneficial fungi for pest management and growth promotion. Uh, another has focused on emissions of greenhouse gases from organic systems, depending on how they're managed. And at the cover crop uh, cocktail site with, that we call that cover crop experiment, uh, there's a current focus on uh, a decision tool uh, based on cover crop biomass and composition and being able to predict nitrogen requirements um, in corn uh, following those cover crops. And then again, the um, project that I mentioned about looking at the ability to to use successfully microbial products 
in organic systems. And then there are uh, a suite of other uh, projects that e are either focused on organic or are um, have organic components. And uh, several of those deal with organic grain, both feed and food grade grains um, on marketing and production. Uh, we have a project at the uh, Southeast Research and Extension Center led by a plant pathologist that's focused on hemp. And um, then there are also a couple of projects uh, that are focused on organic vegetable production. Most of the other projects are in uh, grain crops. And also uh, there is a project at Penn State on organic beekeeping. I just wanted, I know this um, focus was on research, but as a university, you know, we exist to, um, to educate students. And uh, recently, relatively recently, we established a food systems minor. It's very multidisciplinary and very experiential. And it's um, a lot of the activities in that food systems minor um, are based around the Kiko, um, Keiko Miwo Ross student farm, which is not certified organic, but it is managed organically. And uh, the courses in that system, uh, uh, minor take advantage of that student farm as well as uh, research at the um, research station associated with Penn State. And so we don't have the long history of Rodale in terms of organic, but over the last 20 years we have, uh, I think, are, have grown and are continuing to grow our organic portfolio and um, with some really important outcomes in terms of establishing organic land and increasing our capacity to uh, serve organic stakeholders, growers and ag professional, other ag professionals, and also to educate um, students in the area of organic and sustainable agriculture. And this is um, not in small part due to other organizations in the state who we have who have served as our advisors and partners um, on our various project projects, including Rodale, Pennsylvania Certified Organic, and Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, among others. And with that, I will finish. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Mary will not be sitting on the panelists, but I believe she's going to be joining us. So if you do have any questions for her, go ahead and put those in the chat and she can um, join in if, when they come up. All right, Sam, you're up to show talk a little bit about the roller crimper. All right, thanks so much, Christy. I'll go ahead and get this started. You see that okay? Yep, you're looking good. All right, thanks so much. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Sam Mallory. I'm the director of the Organic Crop Consulting Program here at Rodale. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. Seems like people are joining from all over the world, which is really exciting. So it, it's, it's nice to see you here. And um, hope you can get a little bit out of this uh, depending on what, your, what crops you're growing and what you're interested in. Um, one thing I do wanna say is that the, Part of the reason we're having this series of webinars is because at least at the Rodale Institute, and I know most of the people involved here uh, today with the presentations, we believe that farmers have an opportunity um, in becoming certified organic to be more profitable and to improve soil health over the long term. And so the goal in having these webinars is to start to you know, get people to start thinking about how they can implement some of these practices on their farms um, a lot of this is geared towards um, organic uh, no-till grain production, but there should be some tactics in here that you can use if you're a small vegetable farmer or if you're a livestock farmer. Um, so so the, the reason we're having this is, is to just get more people thinking and get the message out there that there are practices that we can implement that will not only make us more profitable, but also protect our, our soil over the long term. So. I have a, a quick 10 minute presentation here on innovative equipment for weed suppression and soil health. Um, and then I'm really excited to get to the panel. We have a lot of experts as well as uh, John and Drew will be joining us as well. 
uh, that we can answer some of your questions. Um, very briefly, I'll go over what we actually mean by tillage when we talk about that. I know we've talked about it a lot today already in the previous presentations, but I think it's important to sort of qualify it just a bit. And then I want to go over uh, organic no-till and rotational tillage systems, you know, talk about uh, some of the cropping systems that may make sense for you in your operation. And then really the bulk of this, I want to spend on some of the specialized equipment that you may need to be able to uh, implement some of these practices. Um, this will also serve sort of as an introduction for next week's webinar, which will cover um, actually go over some of this specialized equipment and show demos and videos and stuff like that. So that'll be really neat to see. And, and the last slide I have is, is on small scale no-till. I know some of you may be interested on this in this on a smaller scale, and you do have some options and some equipment that you can, you can get a hold of that might help you uh, achieve your goals there. Um, so very briefly on tillage. Tillage can be defined as any operation which disturbs or moves soil. And, and that is generally how people think about it today. It's anything that's disturbing soil. But I'd like to qualify that a little bit in saying that when we discuss tillage in the farming community, we're generally referring to mechanical tillage or any method of soil agitation that you use to prepare the ground for agricultural use, you know, to get a nice clean seed bed. Um, so if we define that, if we define no-till, we would say it's defined as a method of agricultural production, which does not rely on the disturbance of soil to function. We use alternative methods and equipment to control weeds and plant seeds that, you, and plant seed in a way that doesn't require the agitation of soil to create that seed bed. But I'll also say that it, it typically refers to abstaining from the use of mechanical tillage. Those other operations that can be considered tillage on a smaller scale, you know, like hand weeding, using hand tools, um, even something as simple as the movement of soil by organisms like earthworms, that's typically not something that we're referring to when we talk about no-till, even on a small scale. Those things I, I don't think should really be um, qualified as tillage, but it's just something to keep in mind that typically when we talk about no-till, we're talking about mechanical tillage and the lack thereof. Um, the reason this is important is because, you know, tillage actually does have a negative impact on soil when it's used repeatedly over the long term. Um, it breaks up aggregates in the soil that are built by microorganisms. It reduces pore space. It exposes organic matter. Um, it causes uh, fungal communities to break apart. It can create pile pans. So, so this is really comes with repeated tillage year after year after year, and usually intensive tillage. Um, so when we talk about no-till, we're, we're trying to eliminate some of those negative consequences. Why is this important? This is important because no-till is one of the best ways to maintain and improve overall soil health in a production system. By allowing it to, to remain undisturbed, we can preserve that structure that's built by organisms, roots, fungi, and additions of organic matter. And this is all, we're all getting to the innovative equipment part here a, a little bit slowly, but um, the reason I wanna talk about why this is important because it's, it is one tool we have to improve soil health over the long term, but it's not the only tool that we have. There are other ways I have highlighted here. There are other ways to continuously improve soil health that do not require a fully no-till system. It's becoming really popular these days to say that no-till is the way, it's the one and only way to improve and ensure that you have a healthy soil over the long term. And a lot of our research is, is and research done by other universities and institutions as well coming out and saying that might not necessarily be the case. Long-term no-till is certainly one of the things that improves soil health, but it's not the only thing. So maybe that shouldn't be our primary focus. It's becoming very popular and, and that's great. But when I actually surveyed, I surveyed some of the scientists, actually all of the science scientists at the Rodale Institute about you know, what is the deal with tillage? Is, is tillage, is no-till really the, the thing that we should be focused on here when we're talking about improving soil health? And sort of the consensus came around these four points and, and we sort of ranked them from most important to not necessarily least important, but 
the ones that we would prioritize over others. We find that the top ways to improve soil health over the long term, number one, are long term additions of quality compost and animal manures. Um, we see that in the results of our farming systems trial. Um, we see that on, on farms that we go to visit and consult with, we see that those that are using manures tend to do a little better. Um, that is one of the best things we can do. When you add compost, you're adding organic matter, stable organic matter, um, and you're, you're providing nutrients that mineralize over a long period of time. So that we think is the top one. Two and three are sort of tied. Um, an effective cover crop rotation allows you to plant more, I'm sorry, an effective crop cash crop rotation allows you to plant more cover crops. Um, and cover cropping just provides so many benefits to the soil. It helps nutrient cycling, it helps water infiltration, it helps prevent soil erosion. So having that crop rotation in place so that you can incorporate cover crops is a really important aspect of improving soil health. Here at the bottom, now this could be a long list of maybe 25 things. So this being at the bottom isn't really <laughs> too significant, but at the bottom here, we have reducing tillage or soil disturbance. Um, like I said, there are a lot of benefits in keeping those microbial communities and those relationships in place, but um, it's not the only thing that we can do to improve soil health. So keep that in mind as you talk about, as you think about uh, putting some of these practices into your operation. Um, the bottom line here is that using tillage maybe as a rare targeted tool can be a great way to keep your operation profitable and practical while preserving health, soil health over the long term using some of those practices. This is what they, uh, John and Drew have been referring to as rotational tillage. Um, in the conventional no-till system, uh, you can see here we have plowing, disking, cultivating, planting, cultivating. This would be without herbicides, this conventional tillage system. That used to be the status quo. It's really not that popular uh, these days, especially not in Pennsylvania. A lot of people are using this conservation tillage system or, or no-till conventional. And you can see in a reduced tillage, that would be cultivating, planting, um, in conventional no-till, it's just planting and spraying. So there may be some cover cropping in there, um, but there's usually spraying to terminate and then uh, planting into that sprayed cover. Uh, you can see here the system is, it's plant the cover, but terminate it with an herbicide. Maybe they roll down and spray herbicide, plant into the residue, continue to spray for weeds and then harvest and repeat. In the organic no-till system, which has been covered quite a bit here, we're planting a cover, we're killing it with, with mechanical equipment, with a, a roller crimper or any other kind of specialized equipment. We're planting directly into that residue, and then we're monitoring weeds using technology if it's available, like a high, high residue cultivator, and then we hope to harvest and repeat. Now, here's sort of the issue, is that all of these components together um, may work on one crop. Maybe this, we find that this works really well with soybeans planted into cereal rye in Pennsylvania. But when you start to add other crops into your rotation, keeping it in continuous no-till can be an issue. It can be really difficult, which is why we say we, we like to reserve tillage as a tool for bailing you out of some of those difficult situations where you otherwise might not till. So when we talk about organic no-till, we really want to talk about, okay, how can we make this system work practically? If we have to till, how can we do it strategically? And this is sort of what we've been talking about with our rotational tillage system. You can see here, I, I only have a couple minutes, so I'm going to go through these last slides pretty quickly. This is an example of a cash grain rotation that you may be able to, you see some underlined points here of where you may be able to, to till till before corn, uh, you till before you plant alfalfa. This is a five-year rotation. Um, so this rotational tillage, you can see here in this five-year rotation, we're really only tilling three times. So this is something to keep in mind. How, how can you place tillage so that you can continue a healthy system, but not be tilling constantly before every single crop? Some of the equipment, so this is just a little preview of next week and I'll just spend one or two minutes here. Um, some of the specialized equipment that you'll see next week and that you will need for no-till, especially cash grain operations. 
This is a no-till planter, which you've seen pulled behind sometimes when the roller crimper is on the front. Um, it's a lot heavier than other planters, no-till drill. Uh, these tend to be heavy pieces of equipment that are able to slice through residue. That's what makes them no-till. Um, you've seen the roller crimper plenty of times. You don't need a front mount necessarily to use this. It can go on the back of the tractor. I was going to show a video, but it, I think it's it's fairly clear. Uh, if, you, if, if you've ever seen a Rodale presentation before, you've seen this plenty of times, but um, I'll skip the video for now. Dawn Equipment makes a smaller roller uh, that's controlled by hydraulic down pressure, which is really useful for places that maybe have uneven ground or you wanna control that pressure on each planting point. It typically goes right in front of the planter, as you can see on the right. Um, an interseeder is another thing we'll be talking about. Um, when, you're, when you're trying to implement a no-till rotation, it's nice to be able to plant that cover crop um, that you expect to roll down the next year while your cash crop is currently growing. So this is a tool that can be used for that. We have some inner row mowing systems. This one on the left is from Dawn that has recently been sort of modified and discontinued, but uh, a way to control weeds that are already coming up through your mulch. On the right is a weed zapper that can control uh, weeds that come up above the crop canopy. And for those of you that are vegetable farmers, um, they make no-till transplanters as well. Uh, I think this is, this is a really neat way for vegetable farmers, small scale farmers to get involved in no-till is to start planting some of their, for example, vining crops on uh, rolled down covers. And if you're thinking about small scale no-till, this is my last slide. Um, you know, much of the practices in the previous slides can be implemented on a small scale, but it's important that when you're at that smaller scale, your, your profitability is a little more difficult. So really recognize that you can keep shallow tillage as an important tool there. But in terms of the, the crimping and, and rolling down cover, you know, they make little uh, roller crimpers. I know that INJ Manufacturing makes roller, roller crimpers for the back of ATVs. Um, there's a roller that goes on a, a BCS uh, walk behind tractor. So you can really make these things work on a smaller scale. It's just a matter of implementing them um, at, at it with reason, you know, not doing it on your whole farm at the same time, not doing it with every crop, but just trying out a few and seeing if it works for you. All right, thanks so much. Uh, we'll move on to the panel now. And um, great. Yeah, great to see everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so I'd like to encourage everybody. We're at an hour. We have another half an hour for open discussion. Seeing awesome questions coming in, but if you haven't done so already, turn off your cameras and get around, uh, get up and stretch a little bit and shake out because um, we still have a little bit to go. Um, so before we jump into the panel, we've already met um, Drew and John, but Andy uh, Flinchbaugh and Dean James are here with us. So I would like to invite them just to give a quick um, introduction. Um, just Andy and Dean, if you could just introduce yourselves and briefly share a little bit about the approaches that you use to minimize tillage on your organic farm. So Andy, why don't you go first? We can't hear you. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, Andy Flinchball here. Um, I'm a grain farmer, uh, family operation located in York County of uh, Pennsylvania, which is uh, in the south central part of uh, Pennsylvania, not too far from the Susquehanna River and the uh, Maryland uh, state line. Uh, so <clears throat> we've we have about five percent of our total acreage in transition to organic grains currently. And uh, we've taken the idea, of if we're gonna do this, we're gonna kind of use the, uh, the idea of KISS, keep it simple, stupid. So we're sticking with crops that we currently grow, uh, we know, and uh, therefore we're looking at growing, uh, incorporating cash grain corn, uh, soybeans, and winter wheat, and potentially a couple other small grains into our, uh, our crop rotation here. And we're using, uh, we're using planting tools that we have, um, no-till planting equipment, 
uh, drill planters. And uh, the one tool that we did have to purchase in order to make this transition was an INJ uh, roller. Thank you. Dean? Um, can you hear me, Chris? Yep, you sound okay. great. Um, my name is Dean James, uh, farm manager for Don Cotner Farms in Danville. Um, we have around 1,300 acres that we farm and have been no-till for as long as anybody can remember, well over 40 years here. And so we decided to dip into the organic uh, side of things and it was really important for us to stay as close to the no-till as we could um, because of the, the advantages we see with the soil health. And we've been planting green for, oh, probably five, six, eight years at least now. And um, we're just trying to see what we can do to minimize the tillage to get to the organic side of things. We figured if, you know, the, it was as important as it is to preserve the soil and, and the erosion. Um, we needed to start from that point and build on the organic side of things. So um, we're like, like Andy, so to speak. We wanted to try to work with the equipment that we have. Um, and we do have an IJ roller and we've started to use that in their conventional cropping too. Um, so we're trying to incorporate some of the new things that have come out on the conventional side into the organic. Great, we're so appreciative that you can both join us today. Um, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. Drew, this one came up during your presentation, but I think anyone can answer it. It's uh, great. So do planting dates fluctuate based on the first frost date of every year? And I believe this is for cover crops um, in different areas of the country, or does it remain fairly constant? Yeah, I guess uh, the, you know, the short answer is we're, let, we're located in central Pennsylvania, so it really does uh, is dictated by where you are. Um, you know, so the further north you go, you're going to need to plant the cover crops sooner. And the further south you go, uh, you can get away with planting them later. Sometimes in the south, like you know, further south, like Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, uh, farmers are trying to squeeze another crop in. So that also makes it more difficult. Uh, not that we're not trying to do that here in Pennsylvania, but they have probably more ability to do that. So. Yeah, others might have more, you know, their experience, but I'm not sure if it, I guess the frost free date kind of dictates, uh, you know, the need to get most of, the, so the winter annuals aren't going to get killed by frost, um, the rye and the hairy vetch. Uh, so it's just more the ability to get some growth and then get established and grow in the spring. But I know we haven't talked a lot about cover crop mixtures, but people are playing around with things that, that do winter kill or combinations of things that winter kill and don't winter kill. Um, and so there could be benefits or need to plant before the frost free date. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, the next question is, what would, and this is for everyone, uh, what would your steps be for a raw native piece of property that you wanna prepare crops for next year? So this is covered in native grass. And another question came in later that I thought was related. How do you remove grass from your lawn to prepare to prepare it before planting crops. I guess I, maybe I'll take a little piece of that. We have a, a local farm which will be coming out of the CREP program, um, which, ha which has native, you know, big blue stem and some of those um, older grasses in, and it's been there for twenty years, and they've been after us to to do it organically. And we've come up with some different plans. And, and I guess one of the big things is, is to remove the residue that is there now. I mean, our plan started out that way um, because it's a whole farm that's in there to get NRCS to come in to lay out contour strips, remove the cover that is there now and till it and put in a cover crop according to which um, grain crop that we would be going to um, to to, in, to do that in the fall to get rid of what's there to help terminate that sod and then grow a cover to help kind of 
try to smother it out again before we would go to our uh, grain crop in the spring. Other yeah, comments? It, ahead, it's Dan. really it's really difficult to terminate sod without any tillage at all. So I, I would recommend, especially if it's going into any sort of production, that some tillage, even if it's just shallow tillage over a long period of time, to get it mixed and terminated, you know, start out like that, and then maybe you commit to not tilling again for a few years or three, four years. But it's difficult. You, you don't want to be, don't necessarily want to be no-till planting in in uh, long-term native grasses like that. Mm -hmm. This doesn't quite answer the question, but I just thought I might mention that, you know, like in our farming systems trial, we have a alfalfa orchard grass phase. And I would say that in a lot of research studies that I've seen, having a hay phase or maybe a pasture phase where you can, uh, in an organic system, can do a lot to suppress the weed seed bank. So while I agree with everybody else, some tillage is probably necessary. It can actually really help the next three or four years as you transition into that organic no-till because the weeds aren't quite as bad. Sam and, and Drew, has your experience been with, with the native grasses more of a moldboard plow approach rather than say a chisel plow and just mixing everything? It, would one work better than the other? We, we, we're, we're tending to mold board plow, which I know is like heresy probably on, like <laughs> on this kind of conversation. Well, um, that's what we have, but I think they both work. It just requires, you know, you're not going to plow a sod and then plant next a week later. You need close to a month or more to let it break down. And like, like you mentioned, Dean, you know, having some contour strips, you know, I wouldn't plow an entire big open field. It'd be good to see it. Uh, and, and then leave that all sit for a month or more. So it'd be good to see a rotation in, with strips so there's some protection um, there. Um, okay, so the next question is about moisture control. So how do you control for moisture at germination of your crops? Um, yeah, I guess, how, how about moisture control for germination? I wonder if that was from someone in a dryland area. <laughs> or someone maybe that's too wet. Mm -hmm. It would, I don't, with, with our, our no-till experiences, we really haven't had any issues as far as uh, wet, wet land, wet soils to plant into. Um, maybe Andy can jump in here too. I mean, with the drier soils, if it dried out, early on, you know, it would have to, you'd have to plan ahead with the cover crop to know what would work for you best, um, whether it's termination date or, or the amount of water that it took out of the soils. When I happened to see that question come up in the chat box, I was, I was thinking, you know, like later on in the season, we, we started planting covers because of our shalier soils to be able to keep the soil temperature down and to maintain the moisture in the soils. That's where we start, one of the reasons we started. Yeah, I guess to tag on that, I'd have to say that <clears throat> from a too wet standpoint, the really neat thing about growing that amount of biomass and trying to plant through it is that our soils are filled up with all those roots and I don't think we get the damage, sidewall compaction, et cetera, associated with planting a tad too wet, uh, like you would in a standard planting situation where your soil is just not filled up with roots that are, you know, keeping your soil structure in a really good place. Um, from a planting, if, if you're in a situation where it's too dry, and I think this whole system lends itself to the point where we got to have a lot of different um, plans in place, uh, you know, plan A, B, C, D, and E, and when it's too dry, we may have to divert from the plan of the thing that we really want to do um, because of a failed planning for whatever reasons, you know, um, and I think I think those things 
become even more important in this in this system. That's that's my take. I think this question got answered in a lot of the questions and the follow up conversations. But why do you still use tillage to establish covered crops? And that's for anyone. Well, we've tried it without tilling. Uh, and I guess it depends. I mean, it, if you come out of soybeans, well, if you come out of wheat or oats, then you usually have a month or so and there's still you know, a significant amount of weeds that are there in the field that you, know, you can't burn down with an herbicide. Um, that if you planted your cover crop right into, they'd compete heavily with your cover crop. Um, and so we've tried, we've tried a lot of times not, not tilling and without success. I think the one place where we, where we think we could is coming out of soybeans and planting wheat no-till uh, if we've successfully controlled weeds in our soybeans. And that's where I think some mid-season weed management with new tools uh, could really make that, that's one spot I could see where we would could reduce another tillage in, in, at least in our, our system. Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, and it's, it, it, when you're bet when you're betting at all on the high residue biomass, um, cover crop for your primary weed suppression tool, um, like True said, yet yeah, you need to start clean at seeding in order to get good stand establishment and, and provide that kind of size advantage to the cover crop to be able to compete with the weeds that are germinating in that phase. But um, the more residue that you're planting through, even with a good no-till drill um, or weed trash, um, the, 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 the evenness of the stand may decline and every little gap will show up, will show up then um, in that following season. So, you know, a complete stand and good stand establishment is critical um, to have a uni uniform mat to suppress weeds. So that's why that, you know, a clean seed bed is, is highly uh, preferenced um, in that phase. And we, 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 um, we tried eliminating, we tried no-till, um, no-till planting or no-till sowing uh, winter spelt after soybeans in a rotational no-till system. Um, it, and uh, we were using high, we were using uh, manure injectors to, to supply the, the nitrogen for the winter grain crop for spelt. And we, um, we got pretty comparable yields to tillage-based uh, winter grain production. Um, we suppressed you know, we had comparable weed pressure. We were also trying things like under sowing uh, a clover into that winter grain as well to help with some weed suppression. The one thing that we did not try though is to actually do that into falling no-till soybeans where we would be drilling right into the residue um, that remained. Uh, but we are, we're actually gonna um, give that a shot here in the next couple of years. Okay, so when trying to increase soil fertility and biomass within a few year period, do annual cover crops or perennial cover crops provide more biomass accumulation? I'm gonna go out on a limb and say maybe we might have addressed some of the issues with perennials with native grasses, um, but did anyone wanna to respond to that? I do think you tend to get a little more biomass out of those annual covers, uh, especially in an intensive production system. Um, but something like alfalfa, we're looking at, you know, or, or undersown clover in wheat. Um, sometimes the purpose there, when, when you're talking about biomass, you really want it for that weed suppressive mulch that you're creating when, when you're in a no-till system. But some of those perennials are better at just keeping soil covered and hopefully having some form of weed suppression over a longer term. It's not always biomass is the goal for, for those perennial covers. So, but I think they offer a really good opportunity to get folded into a no-till rotation um, and 
you know, we, we haven't focused a whole lot on that uh, recently, but it's something that I think can definitely work, but not necessarily for the, for the biomass. Mm -hmm. So a question came up about planting multi-species cover crops for additional benefits. Is this something that's done? We, uh, we typically do it and that's where we started out this year. It was, <laughs> we're, we're in our first year transition and we're trying to put a lot of thought in what we do. And sometimes we, we think about things without considering some other parts of it. But um, we had a couple acres of corn this year that we put a moldy species out and thought we were, you know, we were on the right track until came time to plant the corn and we rolled the rod, the balance of clover rolled down because it had a big uh, hollow stalk on it. Um, the winter peas rolled down, but the vetch had just started to blossom and it, it did not want to roll down. And, and we had to make another trip through the field, uh, just driving the rows of the tractor to get it, to get it terminated. But um, in, in looking forward to how we were going to grow our nitrogen for our corn, which is part of what we're doing, yeah, moldy species um, would be a good thing because each, each crop, and I think the folks from Rodale kind of alluded to that, maybe John Wallace did also about the, the advantages that the different crops may bring versus a monocrop. And whether you want like oats to freeze out and then allow a legume to keep growing for corn or, you know, the, the different things that, that are out there. Um, they talk about, uh, well, we watched a webinar from, from Penn State earlier today and he talked about radishes bringing uh, sulfur out of the soil. And so, you know, the different things for different applications, it's, it's quite complicated, um, even, trying to work out some of these rotations two years in advance to get everything lined up to be able to do what you want to do and using the covers that you want to use. Mm -hmm. I mentioned a little bit when I introduced myself, we, we try to keep things simple. And uh, this, this whole system of organic and then trying to throw no-till on top of that it, it makes things just extremely complicated. Uh, uh, Dean mentioned how far out you're thinking in crop rotations and whatnot. I guess, you know, we've, we've taken the idea that we're going to stick to, you know, we understand the benefits of some of these mixtures, but at this point, you know, we're going to stick to some of the more simple mixtures for corn, you know, vetch and triticale, um, you know, and not take it too far into a mixture just because, we have so much learning to do and uh, the limited research that is out there does suggest that that system does work. Um, and, you know, I guess that's, that's the approach we've taken. It's just the system can be so complicated in and of itself that we're trying to stick to as many knowns as we can at this point. Um, Very practical in this which leads us right into our next question. I think this is a good one for you, Andy. But again, anyone, uh, for newer farmers, what is the most cost-effective set of tractor implements and what is the best way to acquire them? Loans, borrow, collective ownership, go into debt, grants? <laughs> Probably a combination of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess, I, I, I was, I was blessed. I, I grew up in a farm family where we ha I had access to equipment. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, most people that I talk to that started maybe farming without that access, you know, attempted to to hook up with maybe a farmer in the area and, and, and worked with them almost as a mentor. Now, I mean, they, it doesn't have to be a farmer that's using organic practices but you know you can learn about agronomics from somebody like that and at the same time you know maybe uh, you know borrow their equipment rent it um, purchase it as they phase certain pieces of equipment out and I think if that's where you're at in the, in the, the farming your, your farming phase of life I think that might be an excellent way to maybe get started. 
Comments from others? So, some uh, local NRCS um, chapters also have uh, implements that you can rent. Um, No-till drill seems to be a pretty popular one um, that some NRC offices do offer to rent during the year. So check that out as well. Um, but yeah, connecting with other farmers is a great way, great way to make that equipment useful for a number of different people just starting out. Yeah, and just because we have a global audience here, the NRCS is our National Resource Conservation Service. Oh, okay, so should workers wear more protective gear, masks or ventilators when rolling and crimping? If we do so, when, when there's more pollen on rye or other cover crops, so are there any risks with health associated um, with rolling cover crops? No. I would, I would guess the folks with allergies know what affects them and would know what to do that way. Mm -hmm. I think clean from the, a, go ahead, Dean. Make sure you clean the air filters and the radiators out on a regular basis on the equipment. <laughs> I, I was gonna mention the health of your tractor, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, same um, thing. We've had some people that are, have allergies to rye, so we keep them out of the field. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I apologize if you answered this already. I think we might have, but I'm just going in order. So how do you manage volunteer vetch? How do you avoid hairy vetch becoming a weed in your small grain crops in the rotation? I can, I can offer observations in, in our state college work. Um, okay. So it's really difficult. Um, and, you know, one of the practices um, that you might be able to use would be what's called a false seed bedding event. So it's a cool season cover crop, hairy vetch. And so um, after a small grain or even after, say, corn silage or maybe um, corn. Um, you would maybe use some shallow tillage to create a seed bed and encourage that hairy vetch to, to germinate. And then you could come back with another shallow cultivation pass to, to control it kind of outside of a crop. Um, but we, um, in our systems, we don't have a long enough growing season to really make full use out of false seed bending events, particularly in those fall periods. Um, and so, we weren't really able to do that. And we had contamination issues in our, in our small grains with hairy vetch, um, pretty high levels of contamination. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of our work is moving away from hairy vetch because, um, you know, unless you're growing a lot of annual forages to make the rotational no-till practices work, the small grains are, are kind of a nice rotational crop. And, but we also need to make sure that we one, have a, market, a viable market for those small grains and to, um, um, you know, that we can be profitable. And so those contamination issues, but including hairy vetch and cereal rye have been contamination issues in our winter grains that would, we would be growing for a cash crop. So if you are harvesting those for forages, maybe that's another, that's a way that you can, you know, then you don't need a, you know, if you're not taking it for grain, then you can perhaps get on top of those volunteers um, chop, chopping those small grains. When we considered this transition and using hairy vetch for nitrogen production in corn, uh, I was paranoid about that specific question because uh, we wanted small grains for, you know, uh, marketing to, to, so we can market that grain for grain um, in our rotation. And um, Andrew, you hit mute. You went on mute. All right, I'm back, I guess. Um, so one of the reasons we bought a standalone roller crimper, a uh, roller crimper that doesn't fix to a planter uh, or potentially maybe in the front of a tractor was so that we can make multiple passes with that roller if necessary. Um, um, you know, we, we rolled 
just before planting our corn and we've come back and rolled a second time uh, to achieve what we believe was a uh, very high percentage of kill with the, uh, with the vetch. I mean, and I, do, I really believe we would have had time to roll a third time if we would have had. So a Andy, are you, are you rolling after the corn is up then on over the corn? Yeah, I keep moving my microphone. I'm sorry. Come, uh, and what was the question? So, so that those second passes or second or third passes, where where is the corn at? So, uh, we had corn spiking when we made our last roll. Okay. Yeah, and, we we've tried, you know, two passes as a way to improve. We've never really compared one versus two passes, but and we try to go right before corn emergence. Um, uh, so that's, but we've never been able to get complete control. And I, I would say that just observationally too, when the years where we struggle with termination is um, if you have a real wet spring and um, hairy vetch tends to, you know, it gets, once it gets viney, it can end up laying down. And um, when it kind of lays down and, it, and if it's staying wet there, up, you know, as you're approaching the time where you need to terminate with the roller crimper, um, soil conditions are not conducive to getting a good roll crimping action. And so that's really when we've had a lot of trouble with like getting a high level of, of termination with the roll crimper. And I think that's also one of the other benefits of growing it in a mixture with the grass is if you have a nice even stand between grass and the and hairy vetch, that vetch will line up um, the, the grass, either triticale or, or cereal rye, and hopefully it won't pull it down, but if it keeps it up, then your roll crimping action can kind of uh, improve. I would recommend a roller that has sections no wider than six to eight feet wide. Um, no, no matter how flat we think our fields are, they're not completely level. And uh, making sure that the, the roller sections are, are making contact and actually crimping your cover. Um, uh, I know INJ is makes a 15 or 16 foot roller, which is pretty standard, but it's it's one drum. And I know for a fact, we would have a lot of cover that was not crimped if we would be rolling a 16 foot drum across our land. Yeah, I, I just thought I'd also point out that with hairy vetch, even if you control it 100% at planting, uh, those the seeds you planted as a cover crop can sometimes live for two or three years um, just the nature of the plant. So we, we actually haven't had an issue. Um, and I suspect it's because we're mold board plowing and we're probably burying those seeds to a level, uh, where they can't come up. Um, and I guess maybe some other conversations that people mentioned, you know, some of our, our neighbors that tend to be dairy farmers, uh, they don't mind the vetch at all. It's just one more thing in their silage, um, more protein maybe. So, Depends on who you are. So we are past time. It's 1.30 and we still have so many great questions to go through. I don't know the best way to proceed. I don't want to necessarily keep everybody on, but Sam, do you have any ideas of how we might follow up with um, people for these questions? Yeah, there are. So, so um, if you do have any questions, you can contact us at the, the consulting service. Uh, consulting at rodaleinstitute.org and submit your question there and we can try to get you an answer um, or we can send it out to one of our panelists if they if you'd like to ask them a question directly i think that would be an okay way to go um, i just need to say as well i didn't I, I misspoke the nrcs does not rent equipment i saw liz's tag that says nrcs it's soil and co water and conservation districts that do that nrcs can help connect you but I think that's important to say because I don't want everybody calling the NRCS looking for equipment. So, um, but yeah, any of your questions you can submit. Um, you can submit to us and we'll try to get those out to the right people and get them answered. Yeah, and I think, you know, our webinar team too will 
reconvene and see how we can get um, answers to all of these. And I apologize. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This was a great uh, session. Thank you to all of our speakers um, for your time and expertise. Um, and again, next week, same time, same place, um, we'll be looking some, at some more of the equipment. Um, so have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.